Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we're excited to have the chance to learn from Jay Schindler of Fungi for the People. Jay is a fungi researcher, teacher, activist, and farmer based in the Southeast Cascade Mountains of Oregon on traditional lands of the Kalapuya peoples. Motivated by his desires to challenge issues of environmental injustice, Jay founded Fungi for the People in 2010, which serves as an outlet for collaboratively developing appropriate methods for cultivation and problem solving with people and fungi. As a hands-on cultivator and community organizer, he is a focal point of the inspiring community science movement, and I can't wait to hear his take on the role that community mycology can play in empowering people and helping us all develop a more balanced relationship with our environment. Jay, thank you so much for coming on the show. Very much appreciated. I love, I love what you're doing with this show and honored to be on. Well, as I was telling you before the show, I've been a, a huge fan of your work for a long time. Fungi for the People was one of the early Facebook pages I stumbled across probably in 2015, 2016, that just made the whole idea, the whole topic, this idea of community mycology seem real and like something that was so good and worth pursuing. So uh, I, I appreciate you and all the work you've been doing. You know, I am really curious to hear someone like yourself who's been doing this, you know, before mushrooms were cool, you know, back in 2010, what were some of the influences that kind of got you to explore the natural world? And then how did you end up developing a relationship with fungi and mushrooms? You know, some of those, some of the answers to that go back kind of far, like more like around the year 2000 or back when I was in college. Yeah, basically, I didn't really grow up in the forest or anything. I was a city kid. I'm from <laughs> Detroit. Um, but Detroit's a pretty unique city and it has a lot of what we call like post-industrial decay. But decay is one way to look at it. You know, decay is a part of the process. But from that, there's a lot of these really cool pockets of like urban regrowth and like urban nature unearthing itself in like a myriad of different landscapes in a post-industrial city. And so that was like, it's still actually where I draw a lot of inspiration from is just the rebound ecology that can happen from things that are either unintended or intended, um, essentially negative impacts on an ecology, be it a social ecology or be it a natural ecology. And basically the way that those populations respond and the tools that they use or the tools that they birth, um, I still find that a huge inspiration today. As far as like actually getting into fungi itself themselves, um, I actually started with plant pathology um, when I was in college. I wanted to take a lab class that was not physics. I was an engineering student for a long time and just lots of math and physics, and which I you know still in, enjoy in my own way, but wanted to play outside, wanted an outdoor class. So I took, what was it, like an introduction to field botany in the spring in Southeast Michigan. And it was just this beautiful awakening of learning all these different layers of the ways um, seemingly unrelated organisms had co-evolved to essentially seemingly co-conspired to create more complexity and more longevity to their, to what I was at the time seeing as their, their beauty. And within the plant pathology realm, um, I just really got infatuated with when we started culturing in the lab, um, it took like a little bit more advanced class where we were doing culturing and tissue culturing of plants and fungi and um, just really got turned on to the beauty of the diversity, like the visual diversity that fungi display in a Petri dish. And even to this day, I mean, that's some of my favorite parts of this craft. It's just bearing witness to the birth on a 2D, you know, within our environment, like within our 2D created Petri dish type of environment of like what, just like where we can find connection and like visually that's a huge piece 
Well, and I can imagine a pretty big light bulb going off, getting out there in the forest, seeing this complex ecology as someone with an engineering background. I mean, it's not that far removed from thinking of, you know, engineering systems. Yeah, exactly. I mean, systems thinking is really the overlaying, I guess, connection between the two that still keeps me interested, you know, be it trying to find new ways of interpreting and like the, the new tools that people are coming up with for interpreting our environment and getting feedback, as well as um, tools and methods that get invented for cultivation, for overcoming all kinds of challenges that people face all over the world trying to cultivate mushrooms, especially for, for food, which is a little more where I'm focused. And that was going to be my next question was how you saw, you know, fungi and mushrooms as really potent tools to implement change. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that you've got kind of a, I don't know if I want to say rebellious or dissident streak. You know, the the symbol for fungi for the people is a raised fist in front of a spore print. So I know there's there's part of you in there that's kind of railing against injustice, maybe seeing fungi and mushrooms as this tool to address some of the the inequalities that we see, you know, whether it be socially or environmentally. So how did you know this relationship with fungi kind of become part of this or how how did it relate to the drive to implement change? Well, the the big first piece for me was when I had the realization that coming from a background uh, also being from, you know, as an aspect of being from Detroit, where food justice is just a really big issue. There's more now, but um, back, say, in the 90s when I was there as a, you know, a teenager and young adult, we had community gardens and they were plentiful and they were normal. Um, you know, I could talk about those experiences for hours, but um, but it was a big piece of um, where I found a space outside of the harshness of capitalism and like the harshness of the food trade, so to speak, um, where people basically come together in neutral ground and, a, and be able to partner with each other. And from that in turn, partner with the plants that they were primarily focusing on, on growing. And so that's, you know, that's, that was a big piece. And then um, I started growing psychedelics like most of us. So it wasn't really like a food justice thing at first when I was growing mushrooms. My motivation was it's really tough to get a supply of psychedelics in the late nineties in Detroit. So, <laughs> uh, so that was, you know, I was starting to pay attention to, you know, different cultivation techniques. And then when it came into the picture more, when I moved to the West coast, that there just was so much more that could be done with growing food on waste. And I know that's a really simple concept, but that's kind of the beauty of it. And it's alarming how much food and carbon waste that there actually is in the United States. You know, roughly 60% of what's landfilled is raw organics that have a lot of potential wow. to be cultivated. In the, in the United States, and it's the biggest greenhouse gas producer is the methane from, from dumps, like the food scraps, the leaves, the grass that gets put into landfill. That's ridiculous. That's all mushroom food. It's all mushroom food. And honestly, a lot of it just needs a little more critical thinking to figure out how to turn it into substrate. You know, I know we're used to these right. really common substrates that we typically use, but, uh, you know, it's always fun to think outside the box and come up with different scenarios that you know maybe a particular mushroom that we've never grown before would be a really good fit to partner with for those circumstances and that's where a lot of the fun comes in yeah and so there was already this undercurrent just in the experiences you had there in post-industrial detroit where you already were trying to find alternate pathways or alternate ways of being outside the hyper commercialized hyper industrialized system that jars for so many of us with our sense of what should be or what could be. And then moving out to the West Coast, how did you eventually transition into founding Fungi for the People? Because from just reading your work and speaking with you, I know this is very much based kind of in the community. So how was how did Fungi for the People come about? You know, it really was a long road. It was something I wanted to do a lot earlier than when I actually started. 
but I used to have a lot more social anxiety than I have today. And uh, so I just really wasn't ready to essentially launch what what I did and what, what it became. But where for me it really started was, you know, on my own quest, I came to the West Coast to basically learn different forms of farming and also different forms of ecology, just like I wanted to get into different spaces where there was more to engage with and um, more people essentially to engage with the subject matter. Yeah. So I actually started off in Southeast Alaska, working for the University of Alaska in Juneau and going to school there for a little while, uh, mostly working with plants and started to learn the medicinal mushroom or the medicinal plant trade. And the network of people involved in that, which was extremely diverse. I mean, we worked, we worked with a lot of native peoples on their native land. Um, and they were essentially our guides and, uh, you know, oftentimes half the crew when we were doing and the mix of field harvesting and field research that we were doing for the university. And I started to groove with like actually working with really different groups of people than I had ever been exposed to before being from a space that kind of is isolated in its own cultural way um, in Detroit. But then I eventually ended up down in Oregon which really I heard a lot of good things about when I was in Alaska, um, especially for the things I was into and what I wanted to bring together with more people. So I finally, uh, after a couple of years up there, came down to Oregon um, at first to volunteer on a mushroom farm that was a startup that uh, is still local to us and is good friends with, that we're good friends with. But I worked with them for about a year and it was really on their farm where the first essence of Fungi for the People was essentially born, which was I became the volunteer coordinator on that farm because I was there long enough. And what I ended up doing was starting to write curriculum um, for getting people up to speed who were going to volunteer in the farm for a week or more, which was always our goal. You know, it was like trying to get people there for a month, eventually become an employee and become integrated into the farm. And so I started writing curriculum. This would have been back in like maybe 2005, maybe 2004. Where basically, yeah, I was doing it for both the safety of the people, the safety of the farm, and also to just get people into a mode where they're not just coming to work and just only get a blip of like, here's what we need. These are the crappy jobs on a mushroom farm like every mushroom farm has them. There's a lot of stuff <laughs> it's not glamorous yeah so you know i wanted to integrate a lot more reason and depth into like why people might want to stick with the craft or get deeper into the craft and so it was really fun to engage in that way and then eventually i needed to get paid a little better so i moved to eugene took up a job there in my in my old craft which was a mushroom or a Bicycle mechanics. I was a bicycle mechanic for a long time. That was sort of the next phase of where Fungi for the People started to get integrated. I wanted to do basically a multi-shop community research project on trying to find an alternative pathway for all the grease and the, the waste rags that are in the bicycle shops. And you know, hopefully eventually take that project to automobile and, and like motorcycle shops because there's a lot of the same solvents, greases, and uh, pretty harsh solvents that are used in that craft. So anyway, what I did is I, um, I did a little breeding project with an oyster variety and basically kept, I think, 26 different varieties from that breeding project and took, basically aligned the benches at the bike shop with cardboard and you know that absorbed the majority of the pollutants in the shop that were that landed on the bench instead of cleaning the bench with solvents collected those and did a multi-year project where we degraded them with these different variants of this fungus that i had done selections on for their ability to withstand some of these solvents basically that was my first real community engagement and a couple different shops got involved and then um I got asked to teach at a conference on some um, lower tech techniques that I had come up with. And that was the first time I spoke in front of people. I think that was 2008 or nine, somewhere right in there. 
And uh, that went really well. A lot of people wanted to engage with it. We ended up doing it for two days instead of just the three hours that was slotted. We just turned it into this multi-day side show of uh, cultivation practices. And then uh, I didn't know what, how to start. So I let people tell me, like when I got requests from a, say like a community garden group or, you know, sometimes high schools or colleges that have like um, cultivation or waste programs, mostly for plants and vegetables. They'd ask me to come in and, and teach, you know, a day's course, or in some cases it might be three or four Friday afternoons in a row for a particular class and basically engage with their site, engage with their problem, so to speak, and try to help them find a solution to that problem, be it most of the time having to do with food production in a diversified landscape or trying to control erosion on a site or trying to help in dry land climates. You know, I'm particularly inter interested in dry land climates and uh, basically drought tolerance. And so I've been doing work with endomycorrhizae for a number of years and have integrated that into Fungi for the People and got that into a lot more people's hands. Those Those tools for basically finding and cultivating our busket of mycorrhiza. So it's just sort of evolved as people have asked me to do things. And then, um, so the community basically takes it up. And then if I think it's time for me to step out and let people take off with what they're doing, great. Or if I think it went so well that it should be duplicated, then we'll open up a course to the public, which is the face that I think a lot of people know us as at this point, like an educational, space or educational center. That's how I think of you guys now as this community node to learn about mushrooms, but it's really inspiring to hear that backstory and how it really started with you pursuing your own interests and really doing the hands-on work to set up some kind of research on, I mean, in this case, it sounds like remediation was the bulk of what you were exploring and what you're interested in. So just starting your own remediation project, being diligent about it, and I mean, you're dealing with a pretty tough waste stream. When you said grease and then you extrapolated from bikes to cars, you're thinking, oh my gosh, yeah, that's probably one of the toughest waste streams to work with. And if you're able to develop somehow a successful system that uses fungi to then break down some of those tough solvents and reintegrate them, that would be incredible. And I'm sure that's why you got so inspired. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just inspiring. I'm always impressed by people who just start doing that work and then pretty soon when you actually start sharing it, you realize how many people are hungry for this. You know, when you talk about remediation, I think really gets people the most excited is talking about micro remediation and the potentials there. It sounds like a very organic process to then develop this community of people interested in doing their own research. I like how you said, I let people tell me what they want to learn. Because again, that gets to this idea that it's a very organically developing community, you know, how important is that for you, that fungi for the people isn't about Jay, but it's kind of about the community and what people want to explore with fungi? It's huge. I mean, I'm, I'm actually fairly anti-hero. So I'm not <laughs> into like even being the face of fungi for the people, so to speak. Like I, I really enjoy my role and I want to continue to do it for many years, but it's not about me, really. I'm pretty shy actually, yeah. <laughs> about that subject. Yeah, well, you know, what are some of the projects going on now? It sounds like, you know, there's kind of this whole set of different remediation projects. Are you guys doing cultivation as well? Or what are the some some of the things that go on under the the bigger fungi for the people banner? Well, there's a number of things. You know, a big one in the last I think it's been five years now, is um that we started a farm. I've spent a lot of time on different farms over the years, and I've been invited to a lot of really cool spaces and a lot of really cool labs. People have given me a lot of signs of trust over the years, and it was, you know, it's always been really cool. And um, we've had a lot of students come that are, are either already farmers or they're aspiring to be farmers. Um, and I've had a desire to farm myself. So anyway, Long story short, we started a farm and that evolved pretty quickly into being something that 
that was became really focused. We actually primarily grow reishi and turkey tail as dry wholesale product. Part of that is because I'm a polypore nerd, like <laughs> deep polypore nerd. Um, and so I've been always naturally drawn to polypores anyway, but also because I just, I find those varieties particularly beautiful to grow. And I have a background somewhat in the medicinal herb trade just from years past. And, uh, you know, I think that the import pressure from a lot of places around the world that, that people are basically not getting a lot of good access to something that's, that they can be in touch with the farmer themselves particularly around medicinal mushrooms. And so that's that was my motivation there for that project. And that still carries forward. We've moved it a few times, and now we live up in the Oregon Cascades about an hour outside of Eugene. So that's an ongoing project. Um, another ongoing project is I think I've been working on it for maybe three years, which is – it's been a while since I've explained it. But it's essentially we're looking at the diversity – of our buscular mycorrhizae that actually do grow with cultivated cannabis. Like there's a lot of products that exist for the cultivation market that are, are buscular mycorrhizae based, um, but they're typically grown on corn, sour gum, or clover. And so mm. even though there's not a huge diversity of, of species that actually qualifies our buscular mycorrhizae, there's only about 200 within those species, there's a lot of genetic diversity in what they've culturally adapted, oh. just like we'd expect kind of from growing other types of fungi like mushrooms. The, the motivation behind that project was primarily to try to help what we might consider to be a bloated industry as far as the resources that are used for cultivating cannabis, particularly indoor, mm -hmm. and trying to help steer that ship towards a more natural growing style that uses almost no inputs or very little inputs and has very little waste and very little downstream negative effect. So I know it's kind of a niche project, but here in Oregon, and I'm sure where you're at in California, there's been a lot of people interested in the subject. And so it was born out of going into grow shops to set up the farm, buying fans and stuff like that, and them asking me questions about their product and the viability of it and whether or not they think it's worth using. And so I just started doing some basic tests in the beginning. Yeah, it's been a really interesting look just because a lot more people are getting it with other varieties of plants, like focused on intensive cultivation, vertical farming, indoor farming, and all of those systems take a lot of input. So trying to figure out the right potential plant partnerships or pathways for, um, for coming up with, uh, like operating procedures that make sense for ecology being sort of what rules its economy. And how are our buscular mycorrhizal such a key piece in reducing those inputs? Because I think a lot of people know mycorrhizal fungi generally as kind of the internet of the forest, those fungi that are connecting plants and passing signals, but also sugars and nutrients between plants uh, the mushrooms that we know and love as foragers are largely ectomycorrhizal fungi that we find in our, our temperate forests. But then, you know, for our buscular mycorrhizal fungi, why are they so important to farming and cultivation and how are they cutting down inputs? Two things primarily, uh, water management and phosphorus uptake and phosphorus management. You know, in both cases, unlike uh, most of the ectomycorrhiza, most are buscular mycorrhiza concentrate their growth really close to the root system. So they're not usually going to be more than 10 or maybe 15 centimeters away from a particular, you know, from a developed root, like a true root. Um, so they're, they're much more, they're much more inhabitants of the plant itself as well as the soil rather than um, being able to persist in the soil by themselves. So, and the, the amount of protein secretions that they make, and the types of protein secretions that they make are pretty, you know, really fundamental when it comes to uh, drought management and impacted soils that don't have a lot of organic matter or have an abundance of organic matter, but maybe don't have the, maybe the cultivator doesn't have the desire for there to be a lot of decomposers in that soil. Or we're trying to figure out with outdoor cultivation and more large scale agriculture, 
the use of phosphate rock is a huge problem. I mean, we've already, uh, most people probably aren't aware of it, but we've already passed peak uh, phosphorus, like peak oil. We've passed the threshold. We passed the point where there's an abundant future of phosphorus to be mined. Most phosphorus that people work with um, for agriculture is mined from pretty obscure places. People don't usually think about phosphate rock that much. Um, there's a lot of it comes from Sudan. Most of what's left in the United States is underneath the Everglades in Florida. And most of the research, like the kind of the, one of the biggest hubs for research on our busket and mycorrhiza is actually Florida. And that's where I've gone to, to study at UF for working with them. And that's opened my eyes to a lot of the problems that they have in their dune ecologies that we also have in our dune ecologies. For instance, like a space like a dune ecology where... Yeah, what is a dune ecology? Well, a dune, a sand dune, where there's huge mounds of, of sand. The sand dunes, got it. Yeah, okay. sand dunes. There's not a lot of organic material in, in the sand dunes, yet we see grasses, strawberries, pine trees, Y'all have tamarix out in yours, and you have a uh, you have different dune ecology when you get closer to the Bay Area than we have up here. I know ours is a little bit better, but basically, what holds those sand particles together for the most part is protein secretions from our busk in the mycorrhiza, and then those protein secretions they trap moisture, right? Because they're right. sticking the sand particles together, and then within those moisture traps, bacteria can thrive. And so when we think about like um, nitrogen fixing plants and their relationship to bacterial partnerships, to bacterial partners, the arbuscular the mycorrhiza oftentimes are supplying a housing space for those bacteria to be able to persist at those plant roots. And it basically becomes, in a lot of cases with dune ecology or an impacted landscape, one of the main building blocks of the complexity, like the complex future of um, the evolution of that soil. Yeah, so fundamental not only to support their plant partners, but in just binding together the soil. And I think a lot of people probably heard of glomalin, mm -hmm. which is right. the substance that a lot of us know is kind of the glue of soil. Now, are you guys, because I think people may be familiar with this concept of myco mycorrhizae and even commercial inoculums that you can buy. Are you guys trying to cultivate varieties that aren't just kind of the mass-produced commercial inoculum? And if so, what, what are the advantages to that of cultivating specific strains yourselves? It's a great question. Um, you know, I really think about it as communities rather than strains when it comes to arbusca and mycorrhiza. For the most part, we don't culture them in a traditional sense. We grow them with the plant, and you might already be familiar with this, but they're extremely challenging to cultivate in the traditional ways that we cultivate fungi like in a petri dish type of management so we grow them with the plant and then keep the primarily the spores for study mm -hmm. and for re-inoculation of the plot but the main advantage is, is that in every every landscape there's going to be something different there's going to be something different about the way water moves through a site, there's going to be something different about the way animals move through a site. There's going to be something different about the plant communities. There's going to be something different about the way birds and what bird communities move through the site. So then what seeds and what plants grow in that site. And so a big piece of why it makes sense to cultivate or attempt to cr help create an, a unique site-based inoculum for our busk of the mycorrhiza is because it's going to have evolved with that site. You know, for every year, there's mm -hmm. a new, at least one new generation of robust and mycorrhiza adaptivity. And they adapt actually relatively quick, a couple seasons, and you might be surprised what you find. And then also trying to do appropriate restoration projects. You know, the, I think one of the biggest takeoff, the biggest points where um, our busk of the mycorrhiza really took off in maybe popularity within the sciences was for restoration ecology. And at first there really wasn't a lot to work with as far as like a database or a back, a lot of background information about like what plant populations affect the populations of which species of arbuscular arbus mycorrhiza. And so even today, I would say every site deserves that look. Like if you're trying to do plant restoration or 
you know, stream bank restoration or in particular anti-desertification work, like erosion issues in desertified environments or arid environments. Those are going to be environments that are usually either going to be rich in endomycorrhiza or in strongly in need of a population of endomycorrhiza. And um, the first project that really motivated me on them was back in maybe 2012. I went to Telluride for the first time. Got invited out there as like a early morning at the library speaker, like super humble little spot. I was super stoked to be able to show up. And so I had a lot of time to myself during the days, you know, when there was downtime. And uh, I would walk along the riverbank of uh, the Telluride River on the valley floor. Have you been out to Telluride? You know, I have. I have once in 2016. Okay, cool. So you know the landscape I'm talking about a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Basically, the valley floor there is just like this huge classic example of mine tailings waste, dry mine tailings waste, right? So I think, I believe it was silver, if I remember right, was dredged um, through the valley floor. And uh, being familiar with some of what those landscapes can look like, taking walks there and being introduced to the space by different ecologists and different mycologists, I was appalled. I would never had been to, to Colorado. So I was appalled to see fine mine tailings just right along the banks of the river and like the running paths going through there and people frequently using those spaces and there seemingly not being anything done about it. So the next year I was invited back to teach a multi-day course with some other people um, on remediation. And so I wanted to do a project that was site-based. And so I honed in on that valley floor and spent a couple months there um, ahead of time basically trying to connect with the city and trying to connect with the, the EPA uh, managed project upstream. There's a super fun site upstream from Telluride where they're basically trying to manage those issues. And so long story short, basically, I, I don't want to drone on about it because we had to, we had to drop the project because of politics, but. Um, oh, what? You had to drop the project because of politics? Yeah. Telluride politics. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I love Telluride. Don't get me wrong. It just, became impossible right. to manage. But what was cool and what it really opened my eyes to was how that space was a microcosm for many other spaces in the Rockies and really along the West Coast. And how much there was a need to actually work with endemic mycorrhiza. Like we, yeah, I was invited to walk through the EPA research plots and see what they were doing for their uh, restoration and actually was allowed to take soil samples upstream and downstream from Telluride. And uh, just how enlightening it was to see just the bounty of diversity of endomycorrhiza where there was complex understory in intact environments and where there was being replantings done, how the cultivated endomycorrhiza that was used wasn't taking hold. And the plant response rate was kind of typical. It was like 15, 18% rebound. So it motiv basically motivated me to try to get more people on that end. I haven't really picked that project up in a number of years, but I'd love to, if anybody out there wants to engage on that subject of like stream bake restoration on mine tailing sites, particularly solid mine tailing sites in the Rockies. I know you're out there. Hit me up. Let's collaborate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're getting to the heart of this idea where we really get excited about bioremediation and microremediation and the potentials, when you really come down to it, so much of it is site specific. And in talking with another person into e ecological restoration, she really explained to me how so much of it is observation and analysis before you really do anything. And I think 100%. this idea that you were finding such diversity really gets to the heart of that is like, actually, there are players here that we can work with before you know we start trying to just sporulate everything or bring in new strains of fungi to try to remediate you know there might be remedial players already here 100 percent. yeah I'm, I'm all about autochthonous fungi what is underneath your foot what is on your fingertip <laughs> it, well and it's uniquely adapted to that environment which is so important intuitively it makes so much sense but 
when you really kind of take that kernel of wisdom, you can start to see why that's so relevant. And I guess in this case, in this specific example, which, like you said, could be extrapolated to so many other sites around the Western US, but it sounds like for you, the analysis was to see how the uniquely adapted AM, you know, we're using our, I typically use our muscular mycorrhizal and endomycorrhizal interchangeably, but our muscular being one of the types of endomycorrhizal fungi, you were seeing what species were uniquely adapted to this tailings stream bank environment that was imbuing plants with the ability to survive in that environment to then be able to see how maybe those species could apply in other environments. Or was that kind of the drive and seeing how fungi could r- help restore that ecology? Yeah, um, both for restoring the populations and for the potential for um, for heavy metal uptake. Arsenic, zinc, and lead have a very close molecular weight to phosphorus. And through our buscular mycorrhiza, a lot of plants increase their uptake of, of uh, arsenic, zinc, and depending on the soil environment, but can in, increase their uptake of arsenic, zinc, and lead, as well as phosphorus. So you would isolate them, some of those heavy metals potentially in plant populations, and then dispose of those, kind of extract it from the environment, dispose of the plant material that soaked it up? No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. I'm all about trying to lock it up in the environment. I mean, I think that um, that that's like chasing your tail. I, th- I think a lot of, uh, I think it's easy to to think that that might make sense and like, right. It might make sense, but the types of plants that, that uptake really rapidly that you can remove from the environment and um, potentially dispose of kind of require you to cultivate those plants in that environment. Does that make sense? And when we're trying to do a restoration project, it's, it's not typically going to be a space that you're going to cultivate. Right. In the sense where you would be producing biomass that you would want to remove from the environment. So, you know, the other direction that we can take it is long living plants, lock it up in their heartwood. Hmm. Right. Right. Rather, which is much better than it being in sandy tailings piles at the edge of a riverbank being eroded into the river or getting picked up in the wind every time a heavy wind blows. Right. That's a huge improvement. And so just like with any other remediation or restoration project that's out there, you know, trying to figure out what is a reasonable goal to achieve that you can right. try to stick to and actually maybe maybe achieve or always trying to have a contingency plan of like what's still an overall improvement without degrading the site. Right. And it's it's a tough it's a tough part of the reality of it. But that's you know, honestly as a um, facilitator that that's a really big piece. For me, in you know, teaching or trying to facilitate a group project, is trying to help basically people cope with kind of the emotional upheaval that can happen when when dealing with science. That like failure is a huge part of the game, and like that it's not failure of a person or it's not failure of an objective all the time. It's um, you know just a failure on your assumption, and then. You know, you pick up that assumption and you change it. You try again, and hopefully, you get a little bit further. And you before you fail again, and um, th- like you were saying before, the the tools for being able to interpret your impact on your project are really the most vital fundamentals. And that's, I think, where most people, if they wanted to skill up um, in order to be able to do any type of remediation work, it's figuring the tools for interpreting your work right so like if you want to work with water for instance a lot of people are interested in cleaning up water you know there's basic tools like temperature that you're going to need to interpret um turbidity is really simple for figuring out how to interpret a little bit more complex stuff is going to be like the bacteria that inhabit water like this bacteria that we're worried about in particular there's a lot of approaches to that some of them are relatively inexpensive tests like coliscan tests that are basically going to change their petri dishes that change color depending on what variety of coliform bacteria that is on it so those are like approachable methods that 
you know, people can either learn themselves from the company or we teach it in our courses. And also, I think, I think kind of the basic thing with remediation is that, particularly bioremediation, is that there's a reason there's not a lot of protocols. There's a reason there's a, not a lot of like, oh, you have an oil spill, this is what you got to do, or there's an underground tank that's leaking, this is what you got to do. Because it's the do part of it, rather than the, what I think of as the be part of it, which is the observation, right? There's doing and then there's being. So I think of the observation part of it being the most important space to try to inhabit first is trying to be critical of everything you might do and how, what negative impact that might have, you know, introducing more fungi to an environment is not always a positive thing, but in a lot of cases it can be. When you talk about something specific, like a, a leaking underground tank or some other environmental issue where you have an actual toxin entering the environment, usually the other players or stakeholders involved, property owners, whatever the case is, usually they don't want to just be and observe. You know, they want to move quickly. They want to either yank the toxin out of the environment so they get some clearance letter from a regulatory agency. Or, And that was going to be my question is this model of really understanding that unique ecology for whatever microclimate you're in or you know geographical region you're in does our current kind of environmental regulatory framework support that or what in your mind and i know you're not gonna have all the answers even if i want you to jay uh, but in your mind is that framework they have in place people like the epa organizations like that would that support this kind of model or is it better suited to kind of community-based groups that have more time and leeway? I know there's a lot of variables in there. That's a general question. I'm happy but... to tell that because um, I think there's less of a divide between those two things than people think most of the time. Terrific. You know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of both sides of the coin. You know, hardcore academics that only work with reg regulatory bodies and big industry there's a lot of cool people that are doing that work that I've met and then I've had the opportunity to work with at times that are just doing really good work and they're working from the heart. They're just doing what the way that they do it. And then there's an enormous amount of people who are citizen scientists or uh, aspiring citizen scientists or however you want to put it, who see a need, recognize that they're willing and that they want to figure out what to do. And a lot of times they, they know what to do, which is gather people together, concentrate on the fact that there is a problem, bring awareness to that problem, and then try to collaborate and be open to what the collaborations are. The EPA is actually really dependent on public input. I don't know mm -hmm. how much, if they've engaged much with the EPA, but the majority of their projects are based on public pressure. You know, the rest of them are military projects, so to speak. <laughs> so, you know, like, say, for instance, like, we wouldn't really have an EPA the way that we have it today or maybe five years ago unless we had things like the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act, which do really two major things. They're an attempt to try to find a way to set standards for how industries interact with an environment. And an industry might be a city. So, you know, municipalities fit into that category. And then the other part of it is like, is what resources can be used and how can they be applied in order to improve the situation. And so, you know, within the Clean Water Act, there's an aspect of it that requires, to give a really common scenario, is that there would be like an industry in, in a city that um, maybe has wastewater effluent that's impacting a local waterway. Their water runoff or their water effluent is found to have, you know, and they, they get regulated. And they have to implement a system in order to mitigate that problem to whatever the regulatory standard might be. Within that scenario, they have to use the most usually affordable pricing is huge right like but they have to use the most appropriate available technology 
even if that technology is relatively new. And that's where there's a lot of leverage. Like, so if you're an individual who comes up with an idea, tests their idea out to the point that it can be brought up as a solution in some type of scenario, like th- there's almost infinite scenarios, but there's main, there's huge categories that we would look at for environmental, like industrial degradation. And if your technology or your method is on the list of sensible, applicable methods, and it happens to be really affordable, that industry is going to choose your method. We see it happen all the time. That's really a big piece of where the FDA, or uh, sorry, the EPA helps facilitate that. Like there's going to be an EPA representative as essentially a liaison. There's going to be a community liaison oftentimes if it's going to be a Superfund site, for instance. There's going to be a community liaison. The only reason that we have Superfund sites is because they impact people. There's plenty of room to get into the politics of that as to like what people and why the difference between brownfields and Superfund sites. There's a whole other can of worms that has a lot of social justice issues involved in it that I think are really important, but I don't want to commandeer this podcast and that necessarily in that direction too deeply, but but it requires a community liaison on a Superfund site most of the time. And so that's going to be somebody who represents the community and the desires and the needs of the community and how the project is going to impact the community. And so that's a big piece of what steers those projects towards their goal. Like, what is the goal going to be? Is it going to be a park? Is it going to be something that the community can engage with? Or is it just going to be, um, you know, really basic, super important needs? Like, we need to guarantee that these VOCs aren't going to come up in people's basements anymore. You know, no matter how, how much money it takes and how long that takes, like, we need to make it happen. And so there's room in there, you know, whereas the traditional thing might be to cap that off, you know, put in some kind of sub floor kind of cap or cover over it. You're saying there's room in there that if the community or individuals have other solutions that hit those same metrics, the same regulatory metrics of how much the, the presence of VOCs or not, that there's an opening there to implement that if, if there's community pressure and if you have some kind of, of road to, to achieve the same goal. Yeah. And, you know, oftentimes what I think is really cool about the public gravitation towards bioremediation or mycoremediation, the fungal component of that, is that it's oftentimes digestible to a wide variety of people as far as like, what are they going to do? What are they going to do about this problem? You know, are they just going to move it to another community? Are they going to dig it up? Are they going to cap it off? Are they going to purge it? Which is really super challenging work. And, and every scenario is different. But in any case, all these things usually require an enormous amount of patience. The expectation for it to be a quick project or a quick turnaround for most remediation projects really thins the herd on how many people actually engage with the site because there's a lot of projects there's super fun projects that are still going from the first round of super fun projects in the early 70s mm. that aren't done i mean the complexity is every end of it is is really mind-boggling but you know that's what makes it fun at the same time if you're the right type of person one more note though on the epa if you're interested in the subject matter um, the epa has that's really cool part of their site called clue in c-l-u dash i-n and it's called cleanup information and it's a, it's massive i've been using it for years i haven't seen the end of the site and part of it's because they open and open up new parts of it every week so a big component of that is webinars free webinars that they offer usually about two a week and you can also go in and archive all of their historic all the history of their webinars and it's a huge diversity of subjects. Now, um, I've never seen one on microremediation, but plenty of them on, on bioremediation, mostly stormwater lagoons. I would say one should try to learn all these other aspects and not be too mycocentric right. when getting into remediation. Because you can stay mycocentric 
and you know focused on that end of it but trying to figure out how to integrate that into bigger systems that are already at play and finding a leverage point that makes sense for what it is you're trying to to bring to the table really and some of those epa webinars can really help out with that um, there's even certifications on munitions deregulation that are free that you can get it's like a multi-point series it's it's pretty in-depth and then there's a bunch of web pages on probably about a hundred different common toxins and what industries produce them, where they're commonly found as a pollutant and how they affect the human body or the plant kingdom, which is all super valid information. And the EPA provides that you could say for free, but it's a part of what we obviously fund in the government. Yes. Yes. At the end of the day, we are kind of footing the bill for it. But I love how you just bridge the gap between this institutional kind of remediation and the citizen component of it, where in my oversimplified mental model, you know, I kind of think of, oh, there are these big institutional players that businesses have to interact with and engage with to hit these baseline measures of, you know, certain chemicals or certain pollutants in the environment. And they're always going to choose methods that aren't necessarily holistic or as ecologically holistic as we've been talking about with your examples of bioremediation. And that's just the way it is. And community science is always going to be on the outside looking in, trying to implement these projects, doing very small scale things here and there, because we can never prove that economically it's going to be a good substitute for the big industry to interface with the big oversight body. And I think you've just bridged the gap beautifully to say that there is room there for these more ecologically holistic solutions, we just have to keep pursuing them, keep proving them out and see how they maybe fit in the context of that institutional regulatory framework. You know, maybe Clue In gives you some idea or inspiration how your bioremediation project that integrates a microremediation component could actually be an analog for something they've already proven. So that just really expanded my own perspective on this. That's great. That's awesome. I also think that alternative approaches or alternative technologies are part of remediation. It's part of point source remediation. If you come up with an alternative, you know, a, a big piece of that is um, the development of uh, mycotexture and mycomaterials these days as plastic replacements or filter replacements or structural replacements insulation replacements, these are all getting to the source of the problem, which is so much easier to deal with than trying to remove things from the environment that we don't want to be there. Point source is where it always starts. So, you know, all that end of the work I consider to be remediation and obviously lots of headway being made there these days. I love that idea too, that that's kind of the, the start of the fountain of waste streams. You know, if you can replace some of these things with biologically sourced, preferably mycelium sourced components that makes the job easier. And yeah, we've kind of gone between uh, actually remediating pollutions in the environment versus ecologically restoring an environment that may be affected by pollutants or maybe just changes in climate or something that's affected the health of that ecology and using fungi or different bioremediative tools to restore that ecology back to whatever prior state that we deem as and maybe that's a tricky situation too is what are we restoring it to but but to make an ecology as healthy as it can be now is this something that you've entirely taught yourself because you've given a really good breakdown uh, as someone who's worked tangentially in the environmental industry you've given a really thorough breakdown and clearly have a lot of experience i guess first did you have experience in that industry is this all self-taught and then have you had overlap other than the telluride example have you had overlap in what you're doing community organizing with fungi for the people and kind of this bigger environmental regulation picture we've been we've been talking about um yeah i mean no i'm not completely self-taught i don't even if i'm reading a book i don't consider it self-taught at that point i'm learning from somebody sure else. sure you know when i was in college when we were studying botany i was first introduced to some of these subjects through the lens of a stormwater lagoon project that was going on, we were helping collect seed varieties, like uh, endemic seed varieties, or at least 
locally adapted seed varieties to uh, Southeast Michigan and on those sites um, for PCB cleanup. So they help them eyes up to it a little bit. Other spaces have been kind of walked into, I've taken some courses with Princeton Groundwater. Those are pretty heavy hitting, a lot of physics. If you don't have a physics background, not very fun. But they're focused on industrial groundwater remediation. Industrial, not really citizen science or bioremediation. But it was, you know, it's super good to learn from them. Um, I still pull from that resource every once in a while and stay connected. You know, there's people who do awesome work that have opened my eyes to different ways of interpreting an environment and the people in it. Um, Nancy Clem comes to mind as one of those people. She's she's like a, um, I consider her a earth artist. She's does a lot of different things, um, but the way that she works with a group of people when you get invited into her space is just, been, it was a huge learning lesson for me. I think she's great. Other spaces, sometimes it's been um, being invited into projects that already exist. Um, for instance, working with the city of Springfield, which is next to Eugene, helping them redesign some of their stormwater systems. Um, we didn't end up including fungi into some of those projects, but basically getting to come in the back door of like how cities are growing their stormwater management systems as the population grows and where there's leverage for EPA funding for that sort of stuff. So I spent a couple of years doing that type of work with them. Um, yeah, UF, I went to UF Gainesville for a little while, taking courses on our busk and the mycorrhiza uh, cultivation in particular. So those, yeah, those are some examples, but I don't have a degree. Yeah. No, I quit school a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I just never went, never went back after a little bit of time in school there. Well, I mean, luckily you found your passion and were able to pursue all your intellectual interests incredibly avidly. And that is always what I'm struck by, by people like yourself who just went out and were able to find the resources you need and build your knowledge base. And I'm always really impressed by that, by folks that expand their education outside of any formal confines to where they become, you know, incredibly knowledgeable about whatever topic that it that is. They don't necessarily need a, a piece of paper to specifically prove that. If you enjoy it enough, there's a lot of room in mycology to go in some pretty weird directions, right? <laughs> yeah. Even if it's hard, and this is something I wonder if you struggle with, even if it's hard to necessarily make that a, a business or a for-profit thing, have you always stayed away from that? I mean, are you now a consultant now? Or are you mostly trying to do this, uh, you know, outside of a business structure? Um, it's, yeah, it's always been a fragile thing. Like I, you know, when we started Funded for the People, and I still work with this ethos today, I base my budget on how I can do a project, especially if it's a, like, say, educational. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like we, usually charge money for courses, for instance. Sure. The reason for that, it costs money to do them and it takes a lot of time. But my baseline for budgeting is minimum wage per hour per student on time that I'm actually engaging with them. And so then we take that baseline and we use that as our budget. So we do as much as we can with that budget for every workshop. Sometimes we have to put that budget into infrastructure in order to have the workshop. Sometimes we got to, you know, oftentimes we got to put it into food and things like that. But, but that's been a driving piece. So it's kept me from it being a, a business, you know. And the reason that we started the farm was to try to offset those costs. That was the motivation there. We got asked to grow some things that nobody else was growing locally. And so I said, yeah, I guess the timing's okay. You know, I can take a couple months, put some money together, and make a business plan. and you know, do it. It took a couple of years to really get it to where it worked for us. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's always evolving, but that's where we try to keep anything as far as like business really focused is what we produce on the farm. Yeah. I know that's a, a delicate balance to try to keep with something like this is to keep the integrity of it, try to balance material needs that you have practically to, to get things done. Uh, and so I was really curious about that ethos. I appreciate you explaining that. I guess for people who want to do more of this work and you've given bits and pieces this whole time, I mean, this is kind of a 
beautiful class on how to start approaching this kind of work and getting involved. But what are some of your core tenets of advice to people that want to explore bioremediation, maybe microremediation more specifically, you know, how to transfer just their love of mushrooms and mushrooms are going to save the world to getting involved with some kind of community project like this that actually takes those steps toward, toward making change? Um, yeah, two big things, open source labs. You know, I know you got a good one in the Bay Area there. You probably go to it every once in a while. But yeah, any type of open source lab is huge where you can engage with people on different ends of the science that have different, you know, different worldviews, different perspectives, different toolkits, different skill sets, and network with those with those people. I think that that's probably part of the fast track. I think another part of the fast track of uh, gaining some ground is if you like to read. Hopefully, you like to read. I know that podcasts are great and I love them, um, but there's so much in the uh, in the written word that is available to us that's open source. Uh, you know, about half of what's on Google Scholar. If you're not familiar with the Google Scholar, go to your search engine, type in Scholar, and it'll pop up. It's a whole other search format that only does peer-reviewed research and sometimes mm-hmm. white papers, but mostly peer-reviewed research. And uh, I'd say about half of those are free downloads. You can read the whole thing. Um, reading books like Michael Remediation by Harbhajan Zing. That's a really great book. Sometimes it pops up on Scribed for free every couple months. Um, it's a huge book, but lots of really cool background into the craft. Fungi have been worked with as partners in bioremediation since at least the 60s, but really the 70s, late 70s is when it really took off. Um, there's a huge surge of it in the 1980s, especially around agricultural effluent runoff it was the years where they were really trying to tackle like um, beet sugar runoff and uh, lemon water runoff dairy effluent water stuff like that so that was the decade where liquid culture really became industrial scale and there's a lot of really cool research on um, degrading pollutants in a liquid in a liquid culture vat right so like in vessel um, just like same concept as you might do on a really small scale with liquid culture, but actually using that method to degrade pollutants before releasing that water back in the environment. Yeah, there's plenty of work out there on that stuff. It's basically trying to find a thread that you think is cool and following it. Go down the rabbit hole as much as you can and don't be too afraid to reach out to people, you know, even if they're not in your, you know, in your lane, so to speak. Like if they're triple PhDs that you know, are way tied up in academia, oftentimes their work is pretty obscure. And if you come across it and you think it's pretty cool and you write to them and, you know, something like, you know, hey, I really dig what you're doing, you know, don't talk their ear off. Maybe they don't have a lot of time, but like tell them you appreciate what they're you're up to and wouldn't mind some leads, you know, on a particular path. They'll usually get back to you and send you some references or uh, links to different research that might further, further you along your path. And You know, I've had a lot of people um, respond positively to that over the years. So when gatherings come back, right, when mushroom festivals and all that sort of stuff come back, there's a lot of good stuff out there and a lot of really smart people who come out of the woodwork at those gatherings. So a lot to learn. Yeah, there are plenty of people that go to these gatherings or plenty of academics that you won't see on you know, social media on the gram or on Facebook that have actually a massive amount of information. So it's important, you know, as someone who developed a presence on Instagram, you know, it's important to look outside of those avenues because knowledge isn't in any way correlated with social media popularity, which I think all of us know, but it's good to, it's good to have that reminder. And, and just as a final note on the arbuscular mycorrhizae that we, mycorrhizae that we talked about, do you think it's possible or worthwhile for people to develop their skills at cultivating that for use in their own gardens, you know, even if they're not necessarily doing any specific ecological restoration, but to use with plants they want to grow in space that they're they're holding down. If you want to work deeper with your soil, it's one of the next steps and it's fairly accessible. I mean, a $60 microscope and maybe another 50 bucks in soil sieves and you're off running. It's it's not really uh, it's not equipment heavy. It's it's just technique heavy. It takes a lot of patience, a lot of washing soil, 
But I think if you're just, you know, a critical thinker and like to tinker with stuff and want to get deeper into your soil ecology, I don't, I would do it. <laughs> just talking to you about this makes me want to start cultivating Arbuscular mycorrhizal from my native population somehow and using them. It seems like a no brainer, this incredible resource that we have all around us. You know, we don't necessarily need to buy a inoculum or anything like that. And ectomycorrhizae aren't that far out there to work with either. They're even simpler. A little harder to analyze in some ways because they move much further away from pl from plants. And so there's a lot more genetic work that gets brought into studying their ecology. But as far as like, you know, some really low tech ways to engage with them is like if you find something that you like in the forest and you pick up on, or in the city and you pick up on what it's growing with, you know, basically doing a spore wash on uh, impacted roots of that same type of plant somewhere. Like if irrigation ditch gets dug or there's erosion that happens somewhere or an earthquake or a fire happens in a landscape, just doing spores, spores into a five gallon bucket with a tennis racket on top, just dumping into the water and, um, and then dumping that water into the root system. Um, the spores will germinate when, and if it makes sense. And, you know, in the end of the day, that's how you spread them anyway. Like it's not like even truffle trees and stuff like that. It's not that high tech. You make it seem really approachable. And so many of us are into gardening and are already into some of these things. It's not that much of a stretch to start integrating this to our land management right at home. And then with the work you're doing there with the medicinal mushrooms, just to hit on that piece, do you see that as kind of the future for medicinals is that we may be able to rely less on importing medicinals and maybe instead support a more decentralized network of local producers like what you're doing there with, with the medicinal mushroom farming? It's inevitable. I mean, I can have an opinion on it, but my opinion is that I don't think we have another option. So... You know, large consolidated systems aren't agile. So we need smaller distributed systems. I mean, because small, when it comes to mushroom farming and large, it can be mind boggling. Like what I, at this point, what I consider to be a small, medium sized mushroom farm, I think a lot of people would still consider to be a mega farm. Right, right. But then we really look out across the landscape globally about what's out there and what's normalized. Like there's some huge, huge farms, but um, a lot of what is imported in the United States as far as medicinals is coming from a distributed, either distributed farming or distributed wild harvesting. It's not like one huge company growing all of it that gets imported. It just happens to be consolidated through brokers and then eventually coming in on through just two or three different companies per variety. We're already working in that decentralized network of producers, even if we're not cognizant of it. It's just seeing more of that spring up here, you know, in our local areas, uh, I think is is going to be the most sustainable and, and interesting to watch. It's going to be great to look back in like 40, 50 years and be like, wow, wasn't it crazy how things just blew up at this one time and we thought it, maybe we couldn't even predict what was going to happen one day and then... <laughs> You know, in 50 years, we'll, I think, be commonly eating at least 150 different varieties of cultivated mushrooms commonly. I mean, there's almost roughly 300. There's like 290-something I've been able to track down species of fungi that have been cultivated into mushroom, into the fruition of the mushroom as an edible. Um, yeah. Obviously, most of that work happening in China, but, but the more people that get brought in on board, the more we see progress happening. And it's happening right before our eyes oftentimes on Instagram. So it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> right, right in our feed. And that's one of the big general questions I like to ask, I guess, is what do you see the future uh, of fungi? And I think you just answered that beautifully. And then kind of another more esoteric question, do you see mushrooms as, and fungi as being something that can help heal our social ecologies? You know, maybe I wanna ascribe to Utopian a vision, to what mushrooms can give to us, but do you see it as a tool that can become a locus to heal social differences and social ecologies? Yes, but with one caveat. I actually been meaning to bring this up in this talk with you. I don't like to use the terms use fungi 
or tools. Um, mm. I know maybe it sounds a little bit ridiculous, but um, but trying to think of them as a partner and integrating ourselves as a partner with them is a huge piece. And I think that that answers your question, essentially. I, I do think, obviously a lot of us think about this question with psychedelics and that seems to be coming seems to be becoming a much more um, obvious positive impact in the last handful of years, but we, it's been known for a really long time and we really don't need white male authority figures to tell us that it's time to take psychedelics. But that's just me being me. I, I think that, uh, I think that anybody who engages with psychotropic mushrooms gains an appreciation for complexity and gains an appreciation for their smallness in the world and gains an appreciation for nature. And I haven't seen too many people not experience those three things. And I think that that is a pretty good baseline for leading towards a positive impact as a, you know, small communities and global communities. Well, I just love the way you elucidated that, that powerful insight that I know I grapple with a lot that a lot of us feel, but bringing it down, again, to that level of fungi for the people and, you know, the work you're doing there, what's coming up for 2021 in terms of uh, projects, courses, and future plans? Cool. Yeah, we have a few new courses that we're launching this year. One of them I tried to launch last year, but 2021 happened. One of them that's been kind of a long time coming is that we're doing a four-day course on our busket of mycorrhiza, um, investigation and cultivation. Um, that's going to be coming up in May. And then in um, later summer, we haven't posted it on our site yet. I haven't quite launched it, but we're doing a commercial mushroom startup course. So basically a mushroom farm startup course. And uh, that's also been a long time coming. You know, we, we do we do a handful of courses that have been sort of like uh, longstanding traditional courses, I guess, which is the mushroom cultivation design course and our micro-remediation course. And um, our design course has, you know, we've been doing it for almost 10 years. And over that time, more and more people have been joining that want to open up a farm. And so it's kind of been taking the original concept, which was much more playful, and it still is, where we're basically working with the environment more, working on smaller projects that aren't financially focused whatsoever a lot more problem solving oriented stuff and kind of steering it more towards production and like commercialization, which is what some of the, some of the students have wanted. So in order to kind of set a divide between those two subjects, um, we're finally launching our um, mushroom farm startup course, which is basically going to steer people through, you know, for some, the techniques of setting up a, um, a production laboratory and the techniques involved in running a production laboratory, which is, significantly different than a research laboratory. Um, not so much in equipment, but in technique. And then basically um, methods for scaling up appropriately, you know, both environmentally and financially, trying to find a market, you know, all that sort of stuff. And basically doing team building, kind of like we do in our design course, where we focus on everyone's individual project throughout the week. And it culminates at the end really with uh, acting like we're on each other's teams and really like deeply thinking out each other's problems and projects. And so anyway, I'm, I'm really excited for that because I think we'll be able to really hold space for that, for it, its own, its own thing. But I'm not really, last year obviously surprised everybody and like it really unraveled out of hand. We were able to pull off one course at the end of the year, last November, but we had to cancel everything else along the way, obviously. And, uh, yeah, it's been a lot to recover from as a person. You know, it's like it started to really challenge my identity of like, I'm so used to working with a bunch of different people and like a few hundred people a year and a new who I get to meet in this really intimate space and get to create this experience with them. And so I, I've been really thirsty for that. And um, I'm looking forward to this March's course to kick off the year with, with those projects. But as far as other projects, to be real, and I know there's some people I've known for a long time that might be listening to this that don't know. Um, I got diagnosed with Parkinson's last year, and that's kind of a whole new project in and of itself. I've had to 
had to steer my energy pretty heavily in the direction of personal health and wellness and like developing different patterns. And um, what's cool is that's actually turned into a really positive thing at this point, uh, because I've developed some awesome patterns, you know, starting in a really dark spot, but coming into the light. And I'm actually working towards setting up essentially like a Parkinson's boot camp type of thing where we do like a week long um, engagement of basically getting people into better patterns and developing better patterns as a group and mostly exercise and diet focused. But that's, that's a lot of what I got on the menu right now. <laughs> that is certainly plenty of inner work and outer work and restarting courses. And I love how you took something, you know, like a Parkinson's diagnosis and Obviously, you had to do a lot of your own inner work, shadow work, whatever you want to call it. But I love how through that, you've pulled through really what is, from just speaking with you and seeing your work, what is your calling card, which is team building and bringing people together around it. And I'm sure you're going to get a lot of beautiful experiences and solutions. And you know, I'm sure there'll be so much good that comes out of that, organizing people around something like that. And yeah, thank you for, for sharing that, because I imagine... You know, in this time where we have been, you know, gone through this period of isolation, to have that also to wrestle with is is a lot. And uh, I'm happy that it sounds like you're in a place that you're getting more and more comfortable. You're more and more embodying that reality and using it for the good. Uh, so hugely, hugely inspirational. Um, Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, Jay, uh, where can people find out more about you? Where can people find out more about Fungi for the People and connect with you guys? Because obviously, if people are in Oregon, they need to be in touch with you and probably taking your courses. So where can people find out more? Um, our website's a pretty easy spot to start, uh, fungiforthepeople.org. You know, it's been up for 12 years. And you know, people from all over the world join our courses. So it's always, it's always a much more stimulating engagement than you might expect. It's not a bunch of Oregonians. Typically, we get a couple um, at a time, but I'm always excited to have more. And uh, yeah, if anyone wants to engage on a project, I'm always open to try to collaborate, even if it's from a distance. Uh, you can reach me at fungiforthepeople at gmail.com. I won't give you my phone number right now, um, but uh, but I'm pretty reliable on the phone once you do have it. And, <laughs> and uh <laughs> Yeah, I mean, given the context of the year ahead and maybe maybe two years ahead of it being harder to travel and social distance, um, you know, let's do what we can from a distance and at least try to learn together and, and not go back to feeling too isolated in our passions and too isolated in what we think the world needs or what we think people are or aren't doing. It's like all these beautiful people are out there still being beautiful, doing awesome stuff, no matter how hard it might be. It's just harder to connect with right now. So let's, let's tr try and do what we can. Yeah, building community in new ways. A lot of us are uh, faced with that reality. And I guess one message I'm taking from a lot of your work is don't be shy. Reach out, connect, build community, hold digital space, ideally hold physical space because there's nothing like that, um, and, just, and just get involved. Well, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I like to ask all my guests to wrap things up. And judging from your thoughtful insightful answer so far. I'm sure you're going to have some fantastic answers. The first one though, might be the most difficult. What is a mushroom or fungi that you love and why that you want to share with us? Sure. That's actually really easy for me. Even though the name has changed recently, I stick with the old name for now. Um, Fomatopsis pinnacola. I know a lot of people are going to laugh at that because it's so common on the in the Northwest, but it's actually, when I'm traveling out of my like little bubble up here in the mountains and I'm traveling <laughs> around the Northwest or I'm even traveling up into Canada or down into Northern Mexico or as far East as, as Colorado and Montana. And I feel a little bit out of place. I go walk in the woods and it doesn't usually take very long to find Fomatosis pinnacle. And it makes me feel so at home. And I usually pull off, just that outer white growth, right? That new fresh growth on a small one. Usually I try not to take too big a one, but I'll just like hold it and chew on it as long as I can keep it around. You know, I usually got to hide it because it gets kind of slimy and weird. 
so people don't usually know I do this, <laughs> but, but yeah, that's, that's my mushroom. I mean, I know there's a lot of other cool polypores out there, but the commonality of it between a bunch of different regions and peoples and just how much like it's around and people don't necessarily know that it's in your presence is just really cool. No matter if it's, you know, five feet of snow on the ground in the wintertime, it's, it's still there. It's awesome. Yeah, I think that is probably an underappreciated mushroom, uh, myself included, that, you know, has a lot of medicinal potential, like you said, is ubiquitous. Uh, Some of them are really and- basic uses too. Oh my God, you got an ingrown nail? Just take a little sliver of the, the white edge of Fomatopsis pinnacle, or whatever you prefer to call it these days, and um, just pry the nail back a little bit and stick it in there, and it just soothes what ails you. A lot of things with the feet too. Like if you have, um, you, you got a new pair of hiking boots and you're breaking them in still and you're getting like a, a blister in the back of your foot, just taking a piece of that skin, that white new year's growth or new season's growth and using it like a moleskin right up against your skin. It's awesome. It's antibacterial, antifungal, smells great. You know, I put them in my boots in the wintertime this time of year. I just throw chunks in there at night and it knocks back the stank and makes them smell like pine needle tea and i think they're awesome i love that you've just deepened my appreciation for them so much more knocking back the stank in hiking boots chewing gum i mean it sounds like this thing can be fill any need so i love that answer that was that's awesome and then kind of a bigger more general question but what has this relationship you've developed with fungal organisms given to you you know, what's, what's that brought to your life? You can go any direction you want, you know, a new perspective, something spiritual, all of the above, but what has that brought to your life? You know, one big surprise is connection with people. I didn't mm. really have the guts to do community organizing outside of like, I don't want to get too deep into it, but when I was in Detroit, I used to do like uh, immigrants' rights activism. And so that was the only thing I really did with other people in, at large. And so, you know, moving to the West Coast took me a lot of years to kind of settle into a groove where I was like comfortable with a lot of people, I guess. And so finding this niche community, um, which is becoming a pretty large niche, I guess, these days, has really just brought a lot of meaning and appreciation in my life. It's it's helped me appreciate and have faith in people that, that, that I didn't used to have, to be honest. And I know that's not maybe the answer you expected, but, but it's, brought me, it's brought a lot of good people into my life. And that's what I'm the most thankful for. It's not the answer I would expect it, but I think so many people can relate to that. I think that might be a bumper sticker somewhere. Mushrooms restored my faith in humanity. Yeah. <laughs> right on, for sure. I mean, I also think that, um, you know, seeing people find something like special, like this little special thing, right? And I, I learned this studying botany first. It's like, why are people so into flowers? It's like, that should be really obvious. It's the same reason why people should be into fungi. It should be really obvious. I mean, there's this small little space of intimacy and beauty that you have it almost feels like a secret yeah and to be able to share that secret with other people is like and have them also appreciate it and learn the nuances of their appreciation of that secret it's just this really awesome like ever-growing thing and I, and i think it brings this layer of like social spirituality that's really potent and positive but also on the down low like we don't really talk about it as spirituality so much we don't have to because it's just there it's present it's bringing us together and it's growing with us and if we're open to it we we can grow with it i love that idea that it satisfies that spiritual need without any kind of dogmatic belief or without even having to say it we all know that it does it for us so wow really really powerful idea and i'm going to switch up the last question a little bit what is your hope for our future in working with fungi or partnering with fungi 
you know, the world in 40 to 50 years, and you've touched on this already, what's your hope for our future as we develop our relationship as a greater human society or human family with fungal organisms? Well, first and foremost, I hope that we can figure out how to stay on this planet for a real long time in a really positive way and embrace the complexity that's here. And I think that that's the seed that's already been started a lot with this growing fascination in the public, especially in the West with fungi, is that, and I'm hoping that that grows into this into this reality where we value our integration and the complexity of the ecology, not just around us, but from a distance as well. Like that it gives us better connection to like what impacts we have really far away in the world, like what you consume and what impact that can have on that environment and how you can connect deeper into that. Yeah. I just hope that, I hope complexity and uncertainty become more comfortable with people in the long term. Mm -hmm. Uncertainty yes. in the sense that we're not like, you know, how when you start learning about a new thing, like especially fungi and you start to get like kind of confident, like, Oh, I, I know how to do this. Or I know this. Oh yeah. I know that species. And then some, the fall, the like floor drops out at some point again, <laughs> right? where you're like, Oh, actually like, Whew, I'm way humbled again. Like there's so much stuff I didn't know. And that reinvigorates your quest. It like reinvigorates your hunger for exploring this landscape of things you don't know. And that's a big piece of what I really appreciate about science in general is that like, it's not really about truth. Like if you are searching truth, in my, in my outlook, like if you're searching for truth, science might not be the right fit. <laughs> and so like getting more comfortable with like not having, not having the answers to everything and getting more excited about trying to find out the why, trying to find out the how, trying to find out the who, you know, of like the space that we're inhabiting. Because I think that's the biggest pitfall that humans have had and how we've gotten into a lot of these catastrophes that we've created is overconfidence and what effect we have on things. Yeah, we could do with a healthy dose of uncertainty. And my wife always calls it getting comfortable with the mystery. Uh, and I definitely think fungi teach us how to do that. Yeah, and if we can also embody their lessons about symbiosis and decentralization, man, we could see some big, some big shifts if we're just open enough to, to listen. Well, mm -hmm. Jay, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, and you just described a moment where the bottom drops out. I think talking with people like you is why I enjoy it so much is it reminds me of how little I do know and inspires me to learn so much more. Uh, so thank you for sharing all your insights and wisdom and being really open. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to speak with you. Cool. It's been a joy to join. Thanks for having me aboard.